Hello and welcome to night two of Run For Something's Front Row Seat. For those of you who are new to the Run For Something community, my name is Amanda Lippman. I am one of the co-founders and the executive director of Run For Something. Um, before I talk a little bit about what Run For Something does and our mission, I want to thank our national host committee and our sponsors, Authentic Campaigns, Planned Parenthood, Precision Strategies, Civis Analytics, and New Co. Um, for making these events this week and all year possible. We are so grateful to have all of you on our team. Um, I also want to up top thank Mary, our incredible ASL interpreter. Um, We're really glad to be able to make these events as accessible as possible. Um, tonight is going to be a really important and candid conversation on redistricting and gerrymandering and the ways in which state legislatures draw the maps that dictate so much um, of the policy outcomes we get on both the state and federal level. Um, this is a really important conversation for the Run for Something community, especially because we focus exclusively on state and local office, both for the impact they can have on policies and also for their role to play in dictating what is possible on the federal level. For those of you who are new to the Run for Something community, a very brief overview. Run for Something recruits and supports young, diverse progressives running for local office all across the country. Since launching in January 2017, we've identified more than 76,000 young people all across the country who have raised their hands to tell us they want to run. We've endorsed more than uh, 1,600 at this point, and we've elected 499 people across 46 states. Those winners are 56% women, 55% Black Indigenous people of color, and 25% LGBTQ+. Um, they are remarkable. You're going to meet one of them tonight, Dr. Jasmine Clark from Georgia. Um, and they're doing the kind of work that we need more of. I think especially today, and we'll talk about this a little bit, it is so obvious and clear how important it is that we have leaders in local government um, who are <laughs> candidly, who give a shit about actually leading and about holding our communities accountable for making them more equitable, more fair, more inclusive, um, and for really living our values in all of the ways uh, we hope to embody them. Um, if you have any questions at all for me or for any of our speakers this evening, I will be monitoring the Q&A function in the little Zoom bar underneath. Um, so please do drop your questions there. We also have members of our team in the chat um, who are able to answer anything that's on your mind. Um, I'm only going to ask you this once up top and once at the end, if you are inspired or enthused or mad or hopeful or any of the above about what Run for Something is doing, we appreciated your donation to join tonight and we would appreciate another one. Um, your work and your generosity is what makes this organization and this movement possible. Um, so please do make another contribution. I promise I will only ask you one more time before the night is through. Um, I am thrilled by our amazing panelists this evening. We should have two great people. Um, I'm going to uh, read you a little bit about both of them and then bring them up so we can have a conversation. Uh, we are joined first by Representative Jasmine Clark. Jasmine was born in Atlanta and has called Georgia home for over 30 years. Um, when she was very young, she realized her passion for sciences, got an education and career in microbiology, including getting her doctoral degree from Emory University. She currently serves as faculty at multiple universities in the Atlanta area with a focus on teaching and curriculum development. Um, her scientific background brings an incredible perspective to her work in the Georgia State Legislature. She served as the director of the March for Science in Atlanta in 2017. She worked with the Georgia Alliance for Social Justice, um, and she genuinely believes that an inclusive Georgia is a thriving Georgia. Um, and as Georgia is sort of ground zero for some of the worst voter suppression and uh, dangerous laws that we are seeing passed right now, I'm really glad to have her as part of the conversation. Um, Jasmine is also, of course, a Run for Something alum. We we're proud to work with her in her campaign um, and consider her a part of the community. Our other guest tonight is Eric Holder, the 82nd U.S. Attorney General and the Chairman of the National Democratic Redistricting Committee. Eric Holder is a New York native, attending Columbia College as well as Columbia Law School. Uh, he clerked at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the Criminal Division at the Department of Justice. Um, he worked at the Public Integrity Section at the Department of Justice and was tasked with investigating and prosecuting official corruption at the state, local, and federal levels. 
Um, he was nominated by Ronald Reagan to become an assist associate judge at the Superior Court of DC, sat on the bench until 1993, and then was appointed US attorney for DC. Um, he was then named deputy attorney general by President Clinton, becoming the first African American to hold the post, and then was nominated again um, as attorney general by President Barack Obama in February 2009. Uh, he resigned after serving more than six years as AG. He's now the chairman of one of our favorite partner groups, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, an organization that focuses on tackling redistricting from all fronts, legal, grassroots, policy-wise. Um, we're really proud to be partners with both of them. Um, so Dr. Clark, AG Holder, I'd love to bring you up. <laughs> um, again, if you have any questions for Dr. Clark, Dr. Clark, Representative Clark, which title takes pre preeminence here? Um, you know, either one works for me. Um, you know, I'm not really too picky. Um, both of them are uh, show the hard work that I put into, um, you know, the <laughs> things that I've done. But yes, either one will work. Uh, since we're uh, speaking from my position as a state representative and as an RFS alum, I will go with Representative Clark. Representative Clark, AJ Holder, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. Um, I'm really excited to have this conversation with both of you. Um, before we get into a really, I think, interesting conversation about redistricting and gerrymandering, I wanted to open the door to ask how you're feeling today. You know, the, the verdict in Derek Chauvin's trial in Minnesota, the sort of culmination of what feels like decades, but in particular the last year of protest and activism and organizing. I just wanted to give space. How are you feeling? Representative, maybe you wanna go first? Uh, yeah, sure. So thank you for that question. It's an important question. I think many, many, many of us, probably many people, you know, in this meeting today and across the country took a collective sigh of relief when the verdict was read today, um, prior to leading uh, up to the verdict being read. So they said, we have reached a verdict. And then there was this long drawn out period where we were just waiting. Um, I did not anticipate the type of reaction that my body would have. It was actually a visceral reaction. I was physically nauseated. Um, and I was like, where is this, this anxiety? coming from and it was from the fact that we have seen this play out so many times we've seen when the evidence is right in front of our faces and we've been disappointed and so i think everyone was kind of sitting there and anticipating that things would go the way we wanted them to go while also bracing ourselves for yet another disappointment, yet another miscarriage of justice. And so when the verdict was read, we all took a breath. We took the breath that George Floyd was not given the opportunity to take when he was under the knee of Derek Chauvin. And so, um, you know, this is one of those things where, you know, the fact that we all did take a collect, the fact that we were all on pins and needles about something that we all saw with our own eyes is a, um, a testament to, to how a lot of us view our justice system and how we don't necessarily trust that justice will be carried out. I think this is the beginning. Um, true justice means that George Floyd is still here today to raise his daughter and to be with his family and to eat dinner with his mom. But um, what I do hope is that this is the beginning of seeing that arc bend toward justice when it comes to policing in the United States. Yeah, well, you know, I'd say that um, I felt, I think like Representative Clark, a certain sense of relief. Um, you know, the case was overwhelming those prosecutors did a really good job in taking what was a mountain of evidence and presenting it in a really digestible, accessible way for the jury. I salute the judge for putting cameras in the courtroom so that the nation could see what was going on there. But at the same time, I had that same level of anxiety. The fact that the case was proven was not necessarily um, enough. We've seen that in other cases, in, in other matters. 
Um, and so I think what we have now is an opportunity. Um, what we have today is a moment. And the question is whether or not we're going to translate that moment into a continuation of the movement that began with Mr. Floyd's death, you know, last year. Um, we need to pass, you know, the George Floyd um, Act in, in Congress. But, you know, run for something is really important here because the reality is there are about 17, 18,000 police departments in the country. They are run by people um, at the state and local level. The federal government has a very small role um, in our criminal justice system. The vast majority of our, our criminal justice system, the vast majority of it is in state and local hands. And to the extent that we want to have criminal justice reform, and we need it, we have to have it, um, it will be determined by people like Representative Clark, um, people who run for something or supporting. So, you know, there's a connection between what happened today um, with George Floyd and what run for something is all about. If we care about, if we care about justice, if we care about equality, if we care about reform, uh, we have to put people in place uh, who will share those values and who are determined um, to do the work. And that's why run for something is so important on a day, on a day like today. Thank you. And I, and I think I think we often say internally in our team is that we know that elections will not solve <laughs> structural racism or systemic racism or police brutality, but they do have to be part of the solution. Um, so before we get into our sort of topic for the evening, I do want to ask if there's folks on the call tonight who are either considering about for running for state legislature or city council or thinking about their roles um, in these offices, is there any anything you would encourage them to consider as part of their process for reimagining public safety? Maybe A.J. Holder. Yeah, you know, I, I think we have to break some of the paradigms. Um, you know, we give we put too much on the police. Um, you know, they're called in to do, you know, minor things that they're not really trained to do. They have to deal with people who have um, emotional difficulties, not trained to, to handle that. And so I think we need to reimagine, you know, who actually responds to those, those kinds of calls. Um, we need to train police officers better. Um, we need to, you know, make sure that they are conversant with de-escalation um, techniques. We need to also make sure that those biases that we all carry, not just police, but that we all carry um, are, are addressed. You know, they have the power of the state. They have the power to take life as we have seen. And if, unless those biases are addressed, recognized and addressed, you're never gonna get to a place where, um, where we need to be. But we also have to understand that the criminal justice system is part of the larger society. And people always say to me, oh, there's racism in the criminal justice system. Really? Of course there is. There's racism throughout, you know, this nation, system-wide. And so we've got to focus in particular on the criminal justice system. I understand that. But we also have to address um, these racial issues that for too long we have carefully um, ignored. Uh, these are hard questions that we have to ask ourselves, some difficult truths that we have to confront. Um, but I think we are, we're capable of that. I said, as I said, this is, this is a moment. This is a moment. And the question is, will we sustain it and make it, uh, make it a movement? Representative, anything to add? Um, no, I really think that uh, uh, A.G. Holder really um, covered all of the bases. I would just say to anyone that's running for office, like really pay attention to these things. Number one, if you do feel like you have a heart for reform in criminal justice spaces and you really want to see change, don't be afraid to step out there and run for office. As A.G. Holder said, these things are decided at that local and state level. So we need uh, people in our state legislatures. We need people on our city councils and our county commissions that actually care enough to want to do something. And we don't just need one or two, we need a lot of you all. Because, uh, you know, right now, uh, I can say for in Georgia, it looks like we're turning back the clock on criminal justice reform and going in the opposite direction. And it only happens because there are people in place that do not see the, um, the value 
in criminal justice reform, and they want to go back to this tough on crime, lock everyone up and throw away the key style of uh, governing that is, or, or of, of justice that um, we have already shown doesn't necessarily work um, for society. And there's better ways to do this. And so we need you to run for office because we need people who actually care in those seats. Thank you. Thank you both for, for your thoughtful um, suggestions for people thinking about running for these positions. Um, I want to turn to the topic for the evening, because um, I do think we could have hours and hours of conversation about criminal justice reform and, and police brutality and all that, but I do want to focus tonight on the topic for, at hand, um, which is redistricting and gerrymandering. Um, before we dive in, um, A.G. Holder, can you for folks who might be confused about this process, what these words mean, how, you know, level set a little bit, so we're all using the same vocabulary. Sure. Well, let me let me just say this. I mean, people always ask me, you know, what is gerrymandering? And I mean, I'll get a little into a little in, in a bit. But here's the truth. Just remember this: these three words, gerrymandering is cheating. Gerrymandering is cheating. You know what happens is that politicians handpick the people who live in their district. Uh, they decide who their voters are going to be in their districts instead of letting the voters choose you know, who should represent, represent them. Uh, every 10 years, the United States conducts what is a constitutionally mandated thing, a census. Um, part of that data, um, the, the, it's called the apportionment data, is used to determine how many congressional seats and therefore how many electoral college votes every state is going to have. Um, the states then go back, use the census to redraw their congressional districts as well as their state legislative districts based on how the population has changed over the course of the previous 10 years. Now, in, this, in, in theory, this should be done to draw districts that are you know, representative of the people living in the state in terms of partisanship, racial and ethnic groups, urban and rural voter, voters, you know, those kinds of things. Now, gerrymandering happens when politicians manipulate the maps for partisan gain or to dilute the vote of, of a specific group. I mean, if you take a step back, uh, and you look at, look at a state like Ohio, uh, you see Republicans there have drawn a congressional map that gives them 12 of the state's 16 congressional seats, you know, 12 to four. That's a state that's kind of a 50-50 state. And it's, it's a 12 to four state. I mean, among those, <laughs> among those districts is that, you know, that, that brain, brainchild, Jim Jordan. I mean, his district is one of the most egregious gerrymanders in the country. And it looks like, actually looks like a duck. Um, but that's the kind of politician that you get from um, gerrymandering. Because when districts are drawn to favor one party, the result is hyper-partisan representatives in Congress, as well as at the state level. And at the state legislative level, the most gerrymandered legislatures are, are passing the most radical bills on everything from reproductive rights to discriminatory you know, anti-voter anti laws. So again, gerrymandering is cheating. It's the drawing of lines in such a way to favor one party over the other without any relationship to, uh, to principle um, or, or constitutional norms. And Representative, from your perspective inside the state legislature, and you, know, you haven't started the redistricting process yet, but you're getting close. What is the vibe like around that on your end? So um, it's a really good question. Right now, this will be my first time having to go through this process. Um, and so I am bracing myself. I think I've heard so many horror stories about what can happen, what has happened, that I just want to make sure that whatever is the outcome of our redistricting process is fair. Um, in Georgia, we uh, do not have independent redistricting like some other states do. Um, instead, the party in power really has the power of the pen when it comes to drawing lines. Um, right now in Georgia, uh, uh, Republicans are, um, are run the executive branch as well as the legislative branch. Um, so there is really, um, one party making all of these decisions. Um, in 2018, we saw a huge shift in our state legislature as far as um, the amount of power. Um, so in 2018, there was a bunch of seats that were flipped from red to blue. Um, that was the year that I ran. And then in 2020, even though we did not flip as many seats as we wanted to, 
in Georgia, we flipped more seats than in other parts of the country. So what we're seeing now is that a party that sees the other party getting closer and closer to power, now with the power of the pen to um, undo those gains. And so that's what we're bracing ourselves for here in Georgia. Um, you know, and that's just at the state level. Um, we also have to be mindful of the congressional level as well. Um, we have a couple of seats that we are really interested in looking at in this um, process because we are worried about them using, um, again, the power of the ability to draw those lines to um, get rid of one or two democratic seats that were gained in the last couple of elections. Um, and so um, that's where we are um, on the Democratic side. Now on the Republican side, they're probably having a lot more of a relaxed time um, with this process. Uh, we are, uh, again, they have uh, pretty much um, the ability to, to vote for the lines and and all you need is a I believe it's a simple majority so they are able to um, pretty much get the lines that they want um, and so we are, are just going to pay attention we have to be really mindful to look at the data this is where we lean on groups like the National Redistricting Commission to really help us to um, make sure that things are being done as fairly as possible. And when they are not being done, um, we take it to court. So um, we're bracing ourselves. AG Holder, do you have any advice for Representative Clark as her first redistricting cycle? What are you telling state legislators like her? Well, I tell you, Georgia is one of the places that we worry about, um, Texas, Georgia, and Florida major concerns there because the Republicans have a, what I call a trifecta. You have the governor and they control both houses of, of the legislature. And the thought that these folks are going to draw lines in um, a way that is that is fair is probably highly um, unlikely. I think that, you know, Representative Clark is right, that they've got to be, you know, focused on things, make sure that data is the basis for all the line drawing that is done. Um, we are prepared to come in and help in that process. We have our, our, our all on the line component, which is our grassroots organization, so that we can put people um, in places so that they can observe the process where that is possible. We have a, a, a litigation function, so we're prepared to bring lawsuits in states where the process is done unfairly, inconsistent with the, uh, with, with the Constitution. Um, but, you know, it's an interesting thing because, as I said, gerrymandering is cheating. Republicans are at, at a point now where Georgia's, again, Georgia's become a 50-50 state, and yet the legislature doesn't represent that, and I bet after the redistricting, it won't represent that as, as either. Um, Republicans are now at a point where they've got to cheat in order to win. Um, all we have to fight for is fairness, because I'm actually confident, you know, if, if the redistricting process is fair, and if elections are then held on these fair districts, um, progressives, Democrats, you know, will do, will, will do fine. Um, we've got candidates like Representative Clark, the people who, you know, run for something or, or are supporting. Those candidates will do fine. They're in touch with, um, with the people. They reflect the mood of the people. They have the policies that are supported by the people. Um, that's not the case with Republicans. That's why redistricting is so very, very important in this cycle, because they know they have to draw the lines in such a way to frustrate um, the will of the people. You both have mentioned data. The data for redistricting comes from the census. Um, the census was done under President Trump and had its own sort of mess and the delay in the data from the census in part because of the pandemic is also contributing um, to some of the messiness around redistricting. Can you um, level set on, on the census and how that delay is, is affecting this process as well? Yeah, I don't think the delay is necessarily hurting or helping either side. Um, what we do know is there are a handful of, you know, re Republican-led states, um, Ohio and Alabama among them, who are, are trying to sue the Census Bureau to get the data early. You know, this is how they're trying to, go, to get the data early before it's complete. Um, you know, the census was conducted under, you know, extraordinary circumstances in the middle of a, of a pandemic. Uh, and it's absolutely critical that the Census Bureau now has the time to ensure that the data is accurate. And that, I think, is, is the most important thing. 
Um, you know, the deadlines have been expanded. They, it was done under, you know, President Trump, and they took varying views as to how much time they wanted to give the, the Census Bureau. I think the Census Bureau would have said they needed another couple of three weeks to be in, in the field. But they also are pretty confident that with the scientific capacity that they have, that they can extrapolate from the data that they have and come up with uh, what is an accurate count. I can tell you this, it's a good thing that Joe Biden and not Donald Trump is going to be transmitting this information um, to the states uh, because there's all kinds of chicanery that he and Wilbur Ross, the former um, Commerce Department head in the Census Bureau sits in the Department of Commerce, they would have done all kinds of things with regard to the data that would have been, would have been submitted to the state. So I'm actually okay, I think, with where the Census Bureau is. Uh, we should get that data in terms of that, that first batch of data, and then we'll get the, the more granular stuff in, um, in, in September. But I think we're going to be okay um, when it comes to the census, though we always have to care about, and Representative Clark will have to you know, do this at, at her level to make sure that although the Census Bureau, I think, is generally going to do a good job, that when it comes to undercounts, um, we make sure that people of color um, are counted um, effectively, and that can happen at the state level. States have a, have a role to make sure that what the federal government is doing um, is correct. And again, we want to make sure that in particular people of color um, are adequately um, counted and adequately um, represented. Representative Clark, can you talk a little bit about what that looks like on your end, how you go about making sure that especially communities of color are, are fairly represented in these districts? Oops, still muted, my friend. <laughs> I think I am. Um... <laughs> All right. Yes. Yeah, so uh, when it comes to that, we are really, 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 really putting a major focus on this entire process. We are doing trainings every week to really understand ourselves what all goes into this process. We have had a history lesson on redistricting. We have learned about the numbers, about uh, you know the projections as far as uh, whether or not we'll pick up seats. The, the, the current uh, prevailing theory is no, Georgia will not pick up any seats, uh, congressional seats. You know, we are, we're learning about the process. And so that's step one, because I think as we go out into our communities and make sure that everyone is represented, that the counts are accurate, and that our communities of interest are not um, divided up during this process, um, that uh, we know what's going on. Um, and so then step two is actually going out into the community and making sure the community understands what's going on and making sure the community understands why it's so important for people to get, uh, or for people to be counted. Um, the uh, consequences of undercounting are tremendous for certain communities. So we want to make sure that everyone is counted. It's not just, a, um, it is about representation. Of course, we want everyone to be counted so that everyone is fairly represented, but we also um, want to make sure that funding is going into the right parts of our state and redistricting does play a role in that as well. And so after we get this information to the community, we are going to have a special session. Um, normally the special session would happen in the summer, but because of the delay, this special session will not happen until late fall. This does present a little bit of a challenge for people who are considering running for office. Because right now people are considering running for office, but may not necessarily know where those lines are going to end up as far as what seat they're going to be running for. So you kind of have to make some assumptions that you'll be in running for the same district that you live in now. Um, but it's very possible that somewhere in the middle of this process, because people start announcing their candidacy as early as now, um, so that they have time to fundraise and, you know, uh, build a campaign that we uh, people are aware of, you know, where those lines are moving, where those lines are uh, changing. Um, uh, all of those things have to be taken into account. So it's really going to be important that we that the public be aware. And so the the pandemic was definitely something that um, presented a lot of challenges for us. But one thing that the pandemic did that is um, a, a kind of I would say positive out of 
um, a negative situation is more people started paying attention to processes. More people are tuned in to what's going on. More people know about um, the political climate and political processes. And they're starting to understand just how important these things are. And I hope that they remain engaged so that they are aware of what's going on as we present that information to the public through town halls, through hearings and things like that. Um, there's a really interesting question in the um, chat that I'll read out and Shannon Fowler, you should let me know if I'm, not, if I'm misinterpreting this, but if you live in a state that's getting more red, so maybe not Georgia, but I don't know, any number of states that are getting more red, what is the impact of redistricting and gerrymandering on these local candidates and state like congressional candidates? Um, AJ Holder, maybe you have thoughts here. You know, one of the questions you have to ask is why is the state becoming more red? Now, th there could be, you know, an increased number of voters who want to vote for Republicans, for conservative candidates. A state can also become more red because of gerrymandering. You know, it, it may be that you have, as you see in Texas, an increase in the number of um, representatives that they're going to get. But that's largely because of an increase in the Hispanic population which does not generally support Republican candidates. And yet they're gonna to try to draw the lines in such a way that they have an increased number of Republican congressmen and a greater Republican um, you know, glint with regard to um, state legislative districts. So that's one of the reasons. So that's one of the questions you have to ask yourself. Um, and, and, but you know, even if you are in a red state, I mean, a truly red state, I don't know, Idaho, Wyoming, you know, something like that, um, you know, the amount, the number of um, progressives or Democrats who will serve in the, in the state legislature or, you know, in other parts of, of state government should represent the actual um, will of, of the people, even if it's, if it's, it's a minority. You know, it, it's a real difference if 10% of a city council or a state legislature is progressive, democratic in an overwhelming Republican state, as opposed to 30%, 35%. Um, and so just because you're in a red state doesn't mean that you shouldn't be fighting for all the things that democracy is supposed to give to all of its citizens, the right of self-determination. And a larger minority is much more effective than one that is um, unfairly cut, cut back in, in, in size. Um, you know, you hit on something that's really important to the run for some things sort of mission, which is that even in a place that might be 80-20 Republican or 70-30, that still means that there is a core group of people who share our values, who deserve to have representation. And we need, as a party and as operatives, need to compete for and win and try and win in those places in order to represent them. Because even a 20 or 30% you know, presence of Democrats in elected offices can change the tenor of debate and can change the way that these often really shitty bills get, get make their way to the end. Yeah, no, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, you know, you, well, we have to understand this. I mean, these gerrymandered legislatures um, will pass these heartbeat bills. Um, they will not expand Medicaid. They'll do all these things, again, inconsistent with the desires of um, the people that they're supposed to represent. And if you have, you know, if you're in the minority in a, in a red state, you know, maybe you can band together with five, 10 percent of the majority and frustrate the will of those uh, representatives who want to do things inconsistent with the desires of, uh, of the people. But you got to be within striking distance. And that's why making sure that that minority that you might be a part of is as large as it possibly can be. Representative, I'm curious for oh, your yeah. here. <laughs> I was just going to say, I can speak to that from personal experience. When we increased the numbers in our state legislature so that we were uh, within 15 seats of 50-50 and 16 seats of, um, uh, you know, 50 plus one, um, what that scared the majority party. And the reason why it scared the majority party is because while there are some things that their party will lock down on and agree 100% on, every now and then there are people within the majority caucus that are not necessarily okay with just pushing yes for the sake of pushing yes or pushing no for the sake of pushing no.
And so every now and then you have some that will caucus or will, you know, join with Democrats and say, no, I'm not for this. Um, you know, no, this is overreach and I don't like this. Or no, the people in my district actually said they wanted this. So I have to vote for it. And so the closer you get, the closer we get as we inch closer and closer to that 50% mark, the more, uh, the easier it is for us to find enough people in the majority party to, to side with us. Um, and so we've seen it. We have killed some, not all of them, but we have killed some bad bills because we uh, were able to get a few Republicans on our side. Um, uh, Eric Holder mentioned the uh, heartbeat bill while that did pass in Georgia. Um, it barely did. I mean, we were this close. And it, to think that if we had just picked up um, one or two more seats, that wouldn't have even passed at all. And so then you go back and you look at, at the election and you say, there should never be an opportunity for anyone to run unopposed because you just don't know what's gonna happen. And in this case, if we had picked up one or two seats, we wouldn't be fighting um, as hard to stop um, this bill. And we've seen it um, with other bills as well. We've actually been able to kill some bills because we get enough people on our side in the majority party that says, you know, this isn't really right. Um, and so uh, that is a good point. And that is why people should run because your win could be the difference between a bad bill uh, going down or a, a good bill um, being passed. Um, your presence could be that different, even if you are in the minority party. You know, and I think Representative Clark makes a really important point. We've got to have our people running in every possible election. You know, you can't have a wave at the beach unless you've got water. We can't have wave elections if we don't have candidates running for every position, state, local, federal. Every, every um, spot that is up for an election, there should be a Democratic progressive challenger for that, that seat, whatever it is. So, you know, again, that's why run for something is so, so vitally, vitally important. We're singing our song. Um, I'm curious, AJ Holder, if you can give us a little history lesson. How did we get to a place where Republicans have so much control to redraw these maps? Can you take us back a little bit and explain how we got here? Yeah, we just well, in this most recent cycle, I think you go back to um, the 2010 election. If you remember that after um, President Obama was elected in 2008, the reaction to that um, election was the disastrous midterm election of 2010. Remember, he described it as a shellacking. Um, and it happened, unfortunately, just the year before um, we went through the redistricting process. Uh, and so you had in place then from the 2010 election, um, people, large, you know, substantial number of Republicans who decided to use that power to try to gerrymander themselves um, to make sure that they stayed in power and to even expand their um, their ranks through the gerrymandering that they went through in, in 2011. So the, the, the disastrous midterm election of, of 2010 put in place the Republicans who did the gerrymandering in 2011. And the impact of that has been felt, um, you know, for the whole decade. I mean, if you look at like Wisconsin, where on a few occasions, uh, Democrats have gotten more votes than Republicans, I think in the last cycle, like 51, 52% of the votes, and yet have about one third of the seats in the Wisconsin state legislature. And that's all a function, all a function of the gerrymandering that was done in, 20, in 2011. So that is at least one of the ways in which um, they got that power. Uh, the other way in which they have gotten it is to go through, um, you know, racial um, gerrymandering, where They've done things that disproportionately impact um, you know, communities of color. There, there's a long history in our country of weaponizing the redistricting process to dilute the influence of, of black voters and, uh, and other minority groups. And there are a couple of ways of doing it. You pack all the black voters into you know, one district and you, that's all the power that they have is in that one district. And therefore in the rest of the state, there's not any, you know, any African-American power or communities of color don't have power 
or you spread out black and um, uh, and Hispanic voters, other um, voters of color in, in such a way that they don't have power, you know, they don't have power anyways, cracking and, and packing. So it is also, so it's through, you know, the gerrymandering, uh, through the, the power that they got in 2010, inappropriately used in the redistricting, gerrymandering of 2011, plus the historic nature, uh, the historic use of, of race to draw these, um, these, racialized, uh, these racialized districts. Representative Clark, do your voters uh, like? Do your voters care? Do they know what's going on? Are they participating in this process at all? What are you hearing from people when you talk about the redistricting and gerrymandering in Georgia? So I have some voters, some constituents that are very, very, very concerned. I mean, this is on the front of their mind. This is what they ask me at town hall meetings. This is what is in their emails to me. What are you going to do? What are we going to do to stop this from happening? Um, like I said, during the pandemic, a lot more people just got in more engaged in the process and are starting to understand the importance of um, being a part of this process. Um, that said, I, um, I wanted to, uh, kind of bring up one thing and, um, uh, AG Holder, you can, uh, definitely help me out on this. Uh, but I think some of the concerns that people have is the last redistricting cycle, Georgia was still a preclearance state. Um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 had a provision that said that certain states that have a history of not being good actors when it comes to, uh, you know, elections um, and voting rights, they need a little bit more supervision by the Department of Justice for, um, you know, uh, just to simplify it. Um, well, then in 2013, the Supreme Court, you know, got this bright idea that we're in a post-racial society where we've all learned our lessons and racism is not a thing anymore. We elected a Black president twice, so clearly everything's all good. Let's get rid of that. Um, and if this last legisl legislative session was any indication of what Georgia will do post preclearance, um, we have to be very careful because we see that they have absolutely positively no problem passing laws that will disenfranchise certain voters more than other voters. And without that uh, enforcement and that oversight by the Department of Justice, um, I really am concerned uh, that they will continue down this road. And so, um, these are the types of things that we have to tell the public so they understand just how important it is to be engaged and to be a part of the process, why it's so important for us to hear from you, hear from communities, understand what your, quote, community of interest is so that you don't get all chopped up and separated and your voting power get diluted during this line drawing process. But Amanda, you ask a really good question, um, you know, and it's one that has been asked of me, you know, you're talking about redistricting, gerrymandering, you know, people say, hey, my people's eyes glaze over, like, oh, you know, what is that all about? Um, what I said when we announced the formation of the um, National Democratic Redistricting Committee back in January of 2017 was that I thought at least a part of my job um, was to, as I put it, I don't know if maybe the best fate phrase in the world, but I said, it's my job to try to make redistricting sexy. Uh, and that, what I meant by that was to say that we got to make people understand that if you care about a woman's right to choose, uh, if you care about the expansion of Medicaid, uh, if you care about criminal justice reform, if you care about voter protection, if you care about climate, all of those things are determined by the people who serve in state legislatures or at the, at the local level. And that's all about, about redistricting. So there's a direct connection um, between those things that I've mentioned in the redistricting the redistricting process. And so what I've tried to do over the course of the last four years is to draw those connections. If you care about one's right to choose, you gotta care about um, redistricting. Representative Clark is, is exactly right. In 2013, the Supreme Court in the Shelby County case really gutted um, the, the Voting Rights Act. And so a lot, large part of the, you know, what happened in, in Georgia this year would have had to go through preclearance. Um, and with an, Obama, with an Obama Justice Department or Biden Justice Department, I suspect substantial parts of that bill would have been opposed. And my guess is 
um, that a court, if it had to de decide between what the Justice Department was saying and what the Georgia legislature was saying, would have probably sided uh, with, with the Justice Department. And a lot of these um, provisions would not have gone into effect. You know, after the Shelby County case, 17, since then, 1,700 polling places have been closed around the country, mostly in Democratic areas, disproportionately in minority areas. There were 25 states right after the Shelby County case that started to put in place all of these anti-democratic um, these anti-democratic measures, and so that's why, you know, putting putting back in place um, it's the John Lewis bill, the federal bill, will reinvigorate the 1965 Voting Rights Act. That's important. Passing S1, the For the People Act, that is important. Those two bills are extremely um, important to help. Oh, they're federal bills. They will help at the um, at the state level. I want to remind people if you have any questions for either Representative Clark or AG Holder, please do drop them in the chat or the Q&A and I will bubble them up. Um, you mentioned the federal legislation. Well, what can normal people be doing? You know, if whether you're in a state like Georgia or somewhere else where maybe there's an independent, re independent redistricting commission, what can normal people do as part of this process? Let's we'll start with you, um, Attorney General. Well, you know what? Um, I think, you know, the Republicans have told us what they're going to do. Um, they're going to try to, and this is their, their words, quote, secure a decade of um, conservative power, unquote. You know, the, the path to a majority in the, the House of Representatives will likely run through just four Republican-controlled states, Texas, Florida, North Carolina, and Georgia. Um, these states are going to be gaining probably a combined maybe six seats through reapportionment. They're going to have a combined um, uh, 96 congressional seats for the next decade. Um, so I, I, you know, I think our best chance again is to fight, fight back, is to, you know, pass the For the People Act, uh, which would require the use of nonpartisan commissions to draw congressional maps. Um, but we're going to be prepared to fight, you know, state by state on on these issues. Um, our grassroots affiliate, which I mentioned before, All on the Line, you know, has staff on the ground in the states throughout the country, especially in the battleground states. And we're working with partners to, you know, like, like, you know, like, like run for something to increase transparency and public involvement, public involvement in these processes. So if you go to allonaline.org, um, we can show you, you know, how that you can get involved. If, if you're in a state where legislators are trying to, you know, gerrymander the maps, you got to be vocal about it. Show up to testified hearings. Uh, make sure that make sure that they know that um, you know that we're paying attention. We also have to pay attention. Um, and devote resources to state legislative elections. Again, Run for Something has done phenomenal work on this over the past few years, including a partnership you know, with us to get folks to run in critical races that matter for um, redistricting. I gotta be honest with you, you know, Democrats have not necessarily done the best job of this in, in the past. You know, We've thought of elections as being important only if they're federal um, in, in nature. And the reality is that most of the things that impact people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis happen on the state um, and, and local level. And our inattention has hurt us when it comes to things like, um, you know, gerrymandering, the outrageous voter suppressions bill that, you know, that we're seeing in Georgia. So we're going to do everything that we can um, to prepare for, you know, this next round of, um, of redistricting. But boy, you know, local involvement, the, the involvement of, of people, citizens um, in, in this country is really going to be vital. And, you know, too often we underestimate the power that we have. I mean, a unified focused, committed um, citizenry in this country can change things. You know, I'm, you all, none of you all are old enough to remember that, um, you know, the Vietnam War ended not because our military objectives were met, but because the people of this country didn't support it. You know, the, the civil rights movement um, ended, you know, uh, in essence, an American apartheid not because its time was over, but because the people of this country got together and said, we're not going to stand for it anymore. I mean, same thing with all the other great social movements, you know, women getting the right to vote. Again, women, people got together and demanded that it happen. We have the capacity to bring about positive change, but it involves us getting um, involved. Representative Clark, what's helpful for you as a state legislator on the inside? What what can people do to help you navigate this process and fight for fair fair maps and fair representation? So when I think about this question, I think about the power of uh, your voice as an individual. Um, 
you know, if I, Representative Clark, stand on a hill and yell something uh, about redistricting, maybe um, five or 10 people in a crowd might actually hear what I have to say. But if those five to 10 people turn to their neighbor, turn to their friend, turn to their sister, turn to their mom, turn to their social group, turn to their, you know, um, their church members and repeat my message, it will be received. So it is very important that the people who are here tonight don't keep this, don't make this the best kept secret. Um, don't hold it in. Don't keep it to yourself. Tell someone and then tell them to tell someone and then tell them to tell someone. It's very similar to what we say during elections. You know, when we say, you know, don't just vote, but make sure five of your friends or 10 of your friends also go out and vote and tell them to make sure that 10 of their friends also vote. This is the same thing. We have to be conduits of information so that people know what's going on so that they can pay attention so that if they feel compelled to run for office and try to change things, they know how. Tell them about run for something. You know, if um, they feel compelled to write an email or a letter or to uh, host a meeting uh, in their community about what's going on, be a part of the process. Um, a lot of times people are afraid to go and speak at hearings because they think you have to be some type of expert. They assume that the people that are speaking at these hearings at the state capitol um, um, were somehow summoned to do that. But that's not how it works at the state capitol in Georgia. In Georgia, you Joe, Mary, Sally, Nancy, John, Michael, y'all can come to the state capitol. Yes, I say y'all because I'm in Georgia. You can come to the state capitol, sign up and speak about what this process means to you and what these lines are doing to your community. If you feel like these lines are unjust, you don't have to be some type of expert on this uh, topic in order to make your uh, feelings known on the record. And so uh, that's what we need to do. We need to use our voices. We need to use the power of the people. I love what Eric Holder said about how a lot of things that have changed over time in our society have not just changed on their own. It was powered by people who stood up and said, enough is enough. We need to do something. And so if we see injustice in this redistricting process, or if we see that our communities are about to lose the ability to truly choose their representation, if, they are, if their political voice is being diluted by being um, chopped into pieces, or, or if their political voice is being packed into one area so they only have a little bit of representation when they really should have two or three representatives at the state capitol, say something. Say something to your neighbor, say something to your friends, say something to your family, and then say something at these hearings that occur. Say something to your representative about how you feel about this process. Yeah, I'd also say that in addition to what Representative Clark said, you know, you've got to be her. You know, Jasmine Clark became Representative Clark. You know, if you would ask people in Georgia, let's say the middle of 2019, when people were making, you know, political decisions, that we said, well, you know, Warnock, yeah, you ought to run for Senate. Ossoff, yeah, you ought to run for Senate. Joe Biden, you should contest Georgia. And, you know, you could win that. People might have looked at you like you were crazy. And yet here we are, two senators, Democrats won um, Georgia at the at the presidential level. And so, you know, have faith in yourselves. So certainly get engaged in the process, but also have faith in your individual capacity, both to influence things as a citizen, an active citizen, but also have faith in your capacity to win, to win. You know, it, you know like I said, Representative Clark is an impressive young woman. I'm not sure she ever thought, you know, coming from... You know, when she was a kid, she was going to be um, a politician, you know, representative. And yet here she is. She had that faith in herself. She took that chance, you know, she took that chance. And that's how progress is made when qualified people like her decide to take that chance. Uh, but if you can't run for office, you should certainly support people who do make, um, do make, that, make that leap. But we all, we all got to be involved, you know, at some, at some level. 
My last question for both of you, um, and I admit it's sort of a personal privilege one. When I think about the redistricting process and look ahead to what the next decade looks like, I get so demoralized because it often feels a little hopeless. And I know that's part of the goal of the Republican Party here is to make me feel hopeless. Can you tell me why I should not feel so sad? <laughs> um, maybe Attorney General, could you start? Sure. Well, you know, let's be honest. I mean, you know, these past few years have been um, a dark time in our history. You know, despite winning the presidency, um, you know, last fall, we're still in a fight to protect and strengthen our, our democracy. You know, what's given me hope um, is kind of what we've talked about. You know, the civic activism that we've seen going on in this country. You know, people are waking up to the reality um, that the only way to fix a broken political system is a movement. You know, and you think back, really starting with the Women's March, uh, January of 2017, there's been a sustained effort to ensure that we live up um, to our, our, our ideals, what we say we're all about, uh, in, about in this country. You know, whether it's the kids, um, you know, from Parkland High School, the teachers. Remember the teachers who went on strike, um, the rallies that popped up last summer after yet another, you know, black man was killed by the police. Um, you know, we have seen an outpouring. Um, of Americans who want our leadership to actually reflect the goodness and the decency of the American people. So I think we're making progress, but we're not yet where we need to be. So we got to keep up the hard. And yes, it's the sometimes frustrating work of, um, of, of making progress. You know, Dr. King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. But here's the deal. It doesn't bend on its own. It only bends when people um, like you put their hands on that arc and pull it towards justice. And so that's the job for, um, for all of us. If we stay committed, if we stay focused, if we stay supportive of one another, there's nothing that we can't accomplish. You know, it's gonna be hard. It's gonna be difficult. Um, but guess what? We do hard, we do difficult, we win. Um, and so that's what I would say, you know, um, you know, Dr. King is revered and justifiably so, but the civil rights movement didn't proceed in a linear fashion. It wasn't success upon success upon success upon success. There were, there were defeats along the way, and I'm sure he got down, you know, at times. But he fought. He fought through that um, those negative feelings and converted it into um, positive action. And so we must do that um, again. Again, that arc doesn't bend on its own. It only bends when we put our hands on it, pull it towards justice as we have done in the, in the past. So civic activism, I think is the antidote to um, you know, civic depression. No need to be depressed. We need to be angry. We need to be focused. We need to be active. Representative, final words. Yes, um, I love that. I was going to also mention Dr. King's words about the arc of the moral universe, but I think this is a good question to end tonight. Um, and the reason why is because when we first got on, you talked a lot about the amazing things that Run For Something is doing across the country. That alone should give you hope that things are going to be okay. Sometimes when change is incremental, it feels like it's taking too long. And the truth is, um, it really does feel like it's taking too long. You know, sometimes I look at images of the things that we're marching forward right now in 2021, and I'm like, I feel like I'm looking at images of things from the civil rights movement. And I'm like, you know, are we making any progress? Um, but then I speak to people who um, were, uh, you know, who were very active back then during the civil rights movement, um, who say, yeah, I see some differences. We still got a long way to go, but things are changing. But again, it's not changing on its own. So what you are doing, what Run for Something is doing is a part of the solution. Run for Something's impact across the country is something that is going to help change. It's going to help bend that arc. And so um, as you and others on this call, you know, start to get discouraged, number one, understand that is a very natural feeling. We also talked, we also started this call talking about the anxiety that led up to the reading of the verdict today. All of this, you know, we are so used to being disappointed that we just didn't know what to expect. The unpredictability 
of today's verdict um, prior to it being read was palpable. But we, we got the verdict that we all know should have been the verdict. And if that is not just a little glimmer of hope that things are moving mm -hmm. in the right direction, then um, I think that um, we can we can just lean on those types of things. Representative Clark, Attorney General Holder, thank you both so much. One for your kind words about Run for Something, but for joining us tonight for your work, making democracy stronger and better and more equitable, more inclusive, and ultimately less um, less full of cheaters. <laughs> um, we are so grateful to both of you and to Mary, our ASL interpreter, to our entire host committee, to our sponsors, to the Run for Something team who put this event together. If you are inspired tonight, and I hope you are, I know I'm feeling at least a little bit better, um, runforsomething.net slash build is where to go to make another contribution to are, I think, really important work. Um, we will send links to all of our guests uh, tomorrow or later tonight, by tomorrow at this point, um, with information on how you can follow Representative Clark and more on what the National Democratic Redistricting Committee is doing. Um, we are doing these events again tomorrow and Wednesday. We've met just as amazing lineups, really interesting topics. So keep an eye on our social media and your inbox um, for those materials tomorrow morning. Um, thank you again to our panelists and to Mary and to everyone on the Run for Something team and the community. Have a good evening, everybody.